Buonasera a tutti. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to New York University Casa Italiana Zarilli Marimo. It's a great pleasure for us uh, to finally be able to give a solo exhibit to Peter Ruta and to host this evening the opening of the exhibit. Um, it's a terrible night. We are particularly grateful for your presence here tonight. And I would like to ask each of you to be an ambassador of this exhibit. And as soon as you walk out of here, or maybe even when you're still in, post it on your Facebook, tell your friends about this exhibit. Uh, tell them how, how wonderful and incredible a chance they have to admire this selection of Peter Ruta's work here at Casa Italiana for a month. Um, um, I can't wait to listen to the interview that uh, my friend and colleague Ara Merjan is going to do with Peter right now. I have the fortune to briefly interview him for our website uh, last Friday, and we are going to put that up on the website as soon as we're done editing it. Uh, just let me tell you that I'm, I'm so excited to finally be able to give this homage to Peter, to his life, to his career, to his art. Uh, reading his bio, even in a very, very fast way, you realize that he didn't live one life. He didn't live at least, he lived at least, he has lived at least six or seven different lives and very intensely and very passionately. And art has been the fil rouge uh, that accompanied him uh, through the decades. And we are very excited that we have a chance to walk with him through his life, through his paintings, uh, in, the, in the beautiful adventure that uh, his life has been. And uh, without further ado, I would like to ask Ara Merjan, that as I told you is a colleague of mine here in the Department of Italian Studies at New York University. Ara is an art historian, and his most recent book is on Giorgio de Chirico and the Invisible City. We just had a presentation of it last week at the Maison Francaise here at New York University. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy that it's also thanks to Ara that we were able to bring uh, Peter and his art here at Casa Italiana. Please welcome them both with an applause. Thank you. Um, I would join Stefano in welcoming you all, though I would say that it is thanks to Stefano that, um, that we had the show um, and that it came to fruition. Also, very much thanks to Elsa De Giovanni, who did a wonderful job in organizing and putting things together, um, and not least to Peter and Suzanne Ruta uh, themselves, who are neighbors um, here in the village. Um, and have become dear friends um, over the past year. And so it's a real privilege and honor um, and pleasure to have them here and to welcome their friends uh, and family, some of whom I've seen before. And um, it's really wonderful to, to know the, the community that um, accompanies them. Um, and I would note that uh, Suzanne, um, a distinguished author and translator herself, um, uh, is, uh, has been on hand and has helped um, really make the show what it is. Um, and as I'll talk about um, very uh, shortly, she's also the translator um, of Peter's father's memoirs. Um, uh, because Peter's um, relationship to Italy uh, stems back much farther than indeed his own person, um, that to his mother and father. Um, who lived an incredible uh, saga um, on the eve of and during World War II. Now, many of you likely know Peter better than I, but uh, for those of you who don't, just a brief sketch, um, and I think it's significant the extent to which, um, as Stefano said, Peter has lived several lives. Both he and his father um, served in the respective world wars and were wounded um, and are, you know, not only has Peter's career spanned the entire past century, almost um, an entire century. Um, uh, but their lives have really been at the center of some of the last century's um, horrors and travails and triumphs. Um, so Peter was born in 1918 um, in Germany, so just um, as the First World War concluded. And he was raised in Italy before emigrating to the United States in 1936. Um, he studied at the very distinguished Art Students League, where so many um, uh, absolutely 
uh, prominent painters and teachers uh, passed through. And he studied with Jean Charlot, um, who eventually sent him to Mexico to study um, fresco painting. Um, he himself served in the US infantry in the Pacific Theater and was wounded um, in the retaking of Bataan um, in the Philippines in 45. Um, and because he couldn't get Italy out of his blood, he returned there after the war. He returned on a Fulbright scholarship um, and eventually received a diploma um, from the Venice Academia in 1948. Um, returning also, or settling actually for the first time in from 53 to 60 in what was then the poor fishing village of Positano, and as you all know now, one of the prime sites of the Amalfi Coast um, that welcomes thousands of tourists each year. But as you can tell in the very limpid and arresting paintings uh, upstairs, especially from the early 1950s, um, a site of quite humble um, landscapes and still lives in Peter's hands that really um, evoke this site as a place um, not only of uh, aesthetic practice but also um, refugees from all over Europe who settled and worked in um, Positano, which uh, Peter will hopefully tell us a little bit about. Um, just in brief, um, Peter uh, edited the Arts Magazine in the 1960s. He published two books of architectural photography. He worked in France, Spain, southern Mexico, New Mexico, um, and he still paints every day. I um, was at their house last week and just saw some of his recent still lifes that are on display in West Beth, and it's hard to imagine a more hardy uh, man still seizing a brush um, from day to day. But as I, before I begin to interview Peter, um, as I mentioned, his connections to Italy um, uh, may be traced back to those of his parents, um, which are detailed in an absolutely mesmerizing, horrifying, thrilling, and compelling memoir penned by his father and translated with absolute um, beauty by Suzanne from the German. Um, there's really seemingly nothing this woman cannot do. Um, and I just wanted to read a few lines from it. Um, I have not been able to put it down, and I hope soon that it will find a much wider audience. Um, uh, in brief, his father, um, having traveled to Italy um, in around 1923, sensed right after the Beer Hall Putsch in Munich that something was afoot, um, that something did not smell right. And rather than returning to Germany, he essentially called for his wife and children to come join him in Italy, where they thereafter settled in the 1920s. Um, and uh, not long after, sending his two sons, including Peter, to the United States to study um, quite presciently. Um, their experience in Italy um, was, as you can imagine, um, considering that Peter's father, a German citizen, had married a woman of Jewish descent, um, was increasingly harrowing. Um, and um, we can talk a little bit, perhaps, about aspects of that experience, but the, um, the narrative, as Peter father recalls it in this um, incredibly arresting memoir, um, is one of uh, gradually realizing that his host country is no longer a country of refuge. Um, and I just wanted to read you this, this passage um, from uh, 1943 um, when it was announced um, by uh, the king and Badoglio that Mussolini had fallen. For decades almost, I had tried to imagine this moment when I would hear that the regime had fallen, that the fascist regime would go on was as obvious as it was impossible to imagine what would happen next. This inability to imagine what might come next was the strongest force keeping the regime alive. Actually, the regime, or more, more accurately, the system, was already two and a half times dead. Half dead from the failure of the Greek campaign, fully dead with the loss of all African possessions, and dead again, and definitively, with the occupation of Sicily. How could an organism that was already dead two and a half times die again? The official death notice we heard on the radio was actually an inquiry to the nation as to how to dispose of the corpse. Um, so as you can tell, even just from these brief lines, an incredible wordsmith. Um, and in fact, um, if you want to, Julian, if you could just dim the lights really quickly. Um, I just wanted to show a few images. And here, fittingly, is Peter um, painting in 
his haven of Positano um, still doggedly today. And um, just giving you a sense also of the range of his paintings from these characteristic city lifes, not only Italian, but also um, of the New York persuasion. Um, and having moved indoors to still life in recent years, um, and obviously commanding both this very crisp, um, almost Schiller-like architectural position to a, a virtuoso painterly um, technique and command of brushwork in these still lives, which even at, on a large scale, and as I said, I stood before them just a few days, um, are absolutely just wonderful and, and, and breathe with the life um, of this flora uh, on display. Um, his work has been featured in some of the most distinguished venues um, in, in our country, not least art in America. Um, and this wonderful still life, um, we can talk a little bit briefly about some of Peter's influences and origins, um, but I think very much uh, for me really captures, uh, and this I believe from the mid 50s, um, how much he is at once honoring a certain strain of, of the Italian tradition, for example, something like Renato Guttuso in figuration, and holding at bay the abstraction that was taking America by storm. Um, and yet, at the same time, the real kind of humble simplicity and plasticity of these pieces of bread um, and their shadows, conjuring up something of, um, of a Giorgio Morandi as well. And here, um, someone you might recognize in the audience, his buddy Paul, pointing to um, this sign Gluta, from which actually his father eventually gleaned their last name. Their original last name was, I believe, uh, Franca, is that right? Um, and he eventually took on the pseudonym, having um, very gladly, as he details it in his memoirs, um, renounced his German citizenship. In fact, there was an absolutely lovely, by turns, um, deeply disturbing and hilarious moment where he talks about how he goes to the Maresciallo in Italy um, and they essentially tell him that um, you have a choice to immediately essentially divorce your wife because she was Jewish and Italy being allies with the Germans, um, this was to say the least no longer tenable. Um, and they let him know that if, if he did not do so that he would immediately, um, uh, his citi German citizenship would be revoked. And he describes how he attempted to contain his joy at the prospect that his German citizenship would no longer be. Um, so a real sense of humor in, in detailing um, their itinerary. And this, um, uh, an image from Positano, I believe in the 50s, um, that Peter can speak to as well, obviously um, a, a drawing from life um, by him and his peers. Um, this, a, uh, a refugee um, settled in, um, from the war, settled in Positano in the 1950s. Um, and here, um, Peter himself at work at his easel. Um, so I would just open um, by, by asking um, Peter to, to just tell us what, what Italy means to you um, as a painter. What, how has it influenced your work and how what might we think about your work in relationship to Italy, either early or late? In, uh, what? No, in general, Italy, your, how you relate to Italy in terms of memory or practice? Well, I, find your influences. <clears throat> I find Italy a, a unifying force of the European past. And uh, Louder. Yes, <coughs> a unifying force of the European society and art, and no matter what you do, you feel you're tied to a past that goes down to three, four thousand years. And uh, it's um, so certain aspects of a landscape of a people become alive and start moving you. But what really interests me mostly about Italy is the visual element and the sun and the sea and the whole uh, gentle colors oh, are really inspiring and you feel that you should somehow 
create something out of these experiences. <coughs> and you, uh, you've returned, you return still to Positano to paint. Do you feel that there is a continuity since the 1950s when you painted there to today, or have things changed in terms of landscape or that sense of light that you that you speak of? Well, there's always a continuity in one's life. However, I feel that that period is a more isolated period in my life. By chance, I received a ticket to go to New York. And as soon as I got to New York, I got involved in the New York life, which is wonderful. I had some drawings at Maiden Greece. I went to some publishers. I went to the Ladies' Home Journal. A lady waiting there, a lady approached me and said, what are you doing? I have some drawings. She look in, looked at them and said, do you want to work for me? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I didn't know. I said, I don't know anything about it. I'll teach you. She was, a old, she was an old editor, fashion editor of a Ladies' Home Journal. And uh, she wanted to redo the magazine. So I worked on magazines. I tried to get away of, uh, as soon as I could. Once I went to a Greek island, Hydra, and I had a house on top of a village. And I see a woman coming on a mon donkey. It was that editor. He <laughs> said, come back. <laughs> I went away again. Another time I was dancing at the Buco di Bacco in Positano, a nightclub. It was a telephone call from New York. Please come back. <laughs> so she hunted you down? Well, she gave me a certain feeling for American reality of life in America, success in America, you know. <clears throat> which was very important. On the other hand, life in Venice, where I lived for about, off and on for 10 years too. Through Peggy Guggenheim, I met first in a restaurant and later became a great friend and helped to find a palace. And as a wife of Max Ernst, of a realist, and uh, as a gallery owner who had a contact with Pollock, I became no, I got to know a great part of European American artists, which is a different world. But both worlds have, have naturally their own life and their own reality. And the, the 1940s, um, especially in the United States, into the 50s, was the heyday of abstraction, right? Um, and, uh, and Guggenheim's circle in particular, she patronized a lot of abstract painters like Pollock and, and others. How, how did you see yourself in relationship to abstraction? And what, what was compelling to you about figuration instead? Why did you stick with the, the figure and landscape? Well, abstraction at that time was uh, still uh, something really on American in a certain way. It was mostly done by foreign born or emigre painters. They came to New York in 1939 when Paris fell. They influenced the milieu. But um, at the same time, a number of other surrealist painters came to America with different ideas, like uh, the neo-romantics. Mm -hmm. oh. And uh, especially a young American painter, Edward Malkarth, was a great proponent of representational art. Not contemporary representational art, but uh, Renaissance. 
and people ever came close to like Eugene Berman or Leonid were very much involved in 16th, 17th century French painting. And Melkoth particularly, who loved Venice and his group, came to Venice, I met them, and they influenced me very much to paint what you see and to be aware of your uh, yours, uh, society's cultural past. Mm. Maybe, well, maybe since we we've all had a chance to see some of the um, paintings, there are some questions from the audience for Peter, apropos of of the painting or of his career. Um, yes. How long did you stay in magazines? How long did you stay in um, illustrating for magazines? Well, often on, I had, I had to go to Europe. I had a, a daughter in school in England, so my time was limited. And eventually, I got a small job with an art magazine. And uh, when the editor found his desk being used as an, a place for assignments. I became the editor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which was very nice, very uh, extremely interesting. But uh, it left a void in my life. Mm. I, I tried to paint on uh, weekends, and mm. you couldn't do that. I finally quit. Mm and uh, started painting in outside of New York. Mm. I see another hand. Did you, yeah. Okay. I uh, was wondering, uh, there's a shift in your style from the early 50s to the late 50s, when you move from, for lack of a better, from a neo-romantic uh, um, uh, style to something that crisper, more geometric, mm -hmm. and uh, a little more minimal. And I'm wondering what happened to you in that period from, say, you know, in the late 50s that causes that uh, shift. Can you repeat the question? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this gentleman has asked, um, uh, He's noticed a shift in your painting from the early 50s when you still seem to be perhaps under the sway of uh, certain elements of the new romantics um, like Berman and Chelichu, et cetera, to the later 50s when you, the work is more crisp um, and a little bit more simplified. Is there any origin of that change or that shift that you can recognize? You know, not consciously. <laughs> I mean, subconsciously, obviously, yes. Mm. That's a good question. <laughs> it's difficult to explain how you develop. I mean, it happens. Mm. You work and, uh, Without noticing, yeah. It's difficult to explain what the painting is and how, what mm. the creative process mm. is. You're in front of a canvas, you start, and then there's an autopilot that, that works for you. Right, right. And you don't think about it, it just happens. Mm. And usually it's in reaction to what you see, or what you, visually was interesting to you. I see another hand over there. Are there any American painters for which you feel a particular affinity? Mm. Contemporary. Amer American painters for which you feel a particular affinity, either today or in the past. <laughs> Some of the the early por the portrait in the in the in the atrium remind me a little bit of of John Graham and de Kooning's figurative works before you know he delved into abstraction. 
in the in the were those you know those figurative painters like Cutuzo and and others are were they an influence or not consciously. Mm. I mean, I knew uh, de Kooning at that period, the late 1930s. And one of my first shows was a show, actually, a ballet design for the Ballet of de Monte Carlo at that time with de Kooning and other artists. Mm. But uh, no, not really. The Kooning at that time was much more in the mainstream of American painting of 1938, mm. let's say. Mm. I mean, his involvement got uh, was slow and it happened during the war while I was absent. Okay. When I came back, somehow the, it was a the new the dominant of style. Abstraction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in the back there. That's a great question. What about your palette? Your palette, even through all of these changes, remains strikingly consistent. Um, is there something, consciously or not, that you feel an affinity for in terms of color? Not really. No. <laughs> I mean, they are, to, at the risk of sounding facile, they're, they're deeply Mediterranean colors, right? So maybe even in New York, there's a, there's a certain kind of Mediterranean redolence. Yeah. No, I mean, I should add, naturally, the color of a locality influences yeah, your yeah. palette. But there's still a consistency of, of, uh, a certain, of certain hues, absolutely. Yeah, I'd like to know... Uh, is the cause or the turning point for this uh, wonderful explosion of uh, marvelous light and breadth in the newer paintings, uh, which are so much more uh, living, I think, than the, the older ones. So the ones mm. from the, uh, the 90s and 2000s, the, the mm. recent ones, the new ones, they're, they're, they're so much free, freer, flexible. What happened? Yeah, the, your, your more recent paintings, especially the still lives of fruits and flowers, are bursting with a kind of energy in life and are much more painterly. Is there anything that's led to that? Not, not consciously. <laughs> <laughs> We've determined that Peter's painting hand is determined entirely by his unconscious. <laughs> and it's a, it's a lovely unconscious, absolutely. Maybe one more question and, and then we'll... He's, that's right, that's right. Maybe one more question and then we'll go up and, and see these wonderful paintings again. Any, any last questions? No? Okay, well, please join me in thanking Peter.